Welcome back to the High on Life podcast, my friends. I am super happy to be back this week. And my special guest is Dr. Wagani Filate, and she is a respirologist and sleep specialist. And we're talking about sleep and menopause. And so ladies, this episode is for you. And, um, and I think even if you are not at that kind of perimenopause, postmenopausal stage yet, there are going to be so many clinical pearls um, that can help with your sleep and just how do we optimize our sleep? How do we ensure we're getting enough hours and quality of sleep? Because it's one of those things that I feel like it's like on everyone's New Year's resolutions goals list, and then it just never quite happens. And I myself am guilty. I feel like it's on my list every year of like, this year I'm going to prioritize sleep. And then I find myself past my bedtime and, you know, moving past my bedtime alarm every single night. So we're going to get some tips today. So Dr. Filate is an internist. She's an um, adult respirologist. She trained at the University of Toronto. Fun note, she was my chief medical resident when I was going through training. And uh, she was one of those residents that we all looked up to in awe. So I'm really happy that she's with us. Uh, thanks, Dr. Filate. Thanks, Wagani, for being here. Thanks, Ash. I'm so excited. Awesome. Well, let's just kind of jump in. Firstly, how did you get into sleep? So after you finished your internal medicine, you went through respirology. Um, what brought you to, uh, to sleep as your specialty? Yeah, it was never on my goals list when I started residency that I would be spending, you know, my time in the sleep medicine sphere. It uh, just kind of happened. So in the, as you know, when we do our, our training program, especially in respirology, we rotate through different components of the field, including infectious diseases, cancers, et cetera. And one of the rotations was sleep medicine. And I was so impressed by how much patients improved with treatment, that it was such a wonderful experience to be a part of that journey for patients. You know, they would present complaining of feeling fatigued, tired, lack of concentration and focus, and you intervened if they had a sleep disorder. And it was such a dramatic improvement that it was a really, it felt good as a provider to be able to do that for patients. And, you know, that was 15 years ago and here we are. Yeah, that's amazing. I do feel like sleep is one of those things where you can have people and they're like, I'm so tired all the time. I'm exhausted. I'm going to buy this supplement and this vitamin. And like, surely if I just take all of these things and it's like, you know, and, and people don't think about actually just trying to optimize sleep. Do you have any sense of why that is? Like, is it, uh, I think like, it's why are of, we so yeah. resistant? I think, you know, we're all, and I'm guilty like everyone else, we all are looking for the quick fixes, right? We want, you know, to take something that's going to miraculously give us eight hours of sleep and we wake up feeling great. And unfortunately, it's not, it's not like that. Like with other areas of our life, we've got to put the work in, um, like we do with our diet, like we do with our exercise. So I understand why people try to go for supplements looking for that quick fix. But, you know, as we'll talk about, you need to put the work in, right? As you said in the beginning, we need to prioritize sleep. We need to make it a part of our routine, just like we focus on so many of our other aspects of our health. This is a really important part. I mean, we spend a third of our life asleep, right? Yet it's always something we forget about, or it's going to happen naturally. I don't need to plan for it. And especially as we get older, it's it's more interrupted. It There are new sleep disorders that come up. So again, we need to really put the work in, prioritize it. And then, you know, it pays the rewards afterwards. Mm, I think what you said is so key. We need to plan for it. Like, I don't think, I don't think I've ever really thought about planning for sleep. And yet I plan so many other kind of lifestyle health habits, but it, planning for sleep isn't something that naturally comes to mind. So I think that's such a great point. Can you remind us, just remind us of the importance, like why do we need to make sleep st such a priority? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a great question. I mean, think about the nights you wake up feeling rested and think about the nights you had a bad night, your kids were up or you got little sleep and you immediately feel it. Not only do you feel, um, you know, irritable, maybe a little bit on edge, but also your ability to concentrate, to focus, to recall information is, is affected. Um, how we eat, what we eat is affected also by how little or poor sleep we got. 
And then beyond that, I mean, it, it is important in so many other health domains. So it reduces our risk for cardiovascular disease if we sleep well. Uh, our brain health is optimized. There's a lot of research linking insufficient and poor quality sleep to higher risks of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's important for our immune function. You know, when we sleep well, we're more likely to mount an appropriate immune response, um, as well as, uh, you know, even cancer has been associated or linked with insufficient chronic lack of sleep. So it, it spans so many domains of our health that it is such an important part of our overall health journey. Hmm. And when we're talking about quality sleep, is it a certain number of, like, how do we quantify that? There's the number of hours, but then are you having to hit certain like depths of sleep, like are getting into REM sleep? How, how do you decide if yeah. it's so quality. it's, it's, it's a great question because there's a difference between quantity and quality and they don't mm -hmm. always correlate. A general uh, recommendation is we should target between seven to nine hours of sleep per night. And that recommendation came out of, you know, expert consensus guidelines where they reviewed all the literature and said for the average adult, getting seven to nine hours of sleep allows you to cycle through all of the important sleep stages for the uh, right amount of time. Um, so that relates to the uh, duration of sleep. And then the quality of sleep is really subjective. Unless you're going in and doing a sleep study every night, looking at how much of the night you're in the different sleep stages, it really is sort of self-reflection. Like, how did I sleep that night? Did I wake up and do I immediately want to crawl back into bed? Again, that's another indicator of, of reduced quality. So really it's a subjective feeling. Mm -hmm. It's interesting on a side note for two years when I was really just too overworking and too busy, I was probably only getting like six hours of sleep a night. I had bloodshot eyes and I like looked up everything on red eyes and conjunctivitis. And I saw eye doctors and I was like putting all these eye drops in, but <laughs> Like I got a, a, like a steamer for my bedroom, all this stuff, like every intervention imaginable to try to fix my eyes and my eyes just would not improve. And then I started sleeping more and my eyes improved. Like, yeah, I'm not kidding. Two years. I, I, I believe it. And, and people also say like, I mean, I, I haven't seen the research on this, but people even say their skin improves, their their general sense of well being improves. So it it again, it's like like you said, it's your eyes, it's your skin, it's your sense of well being that is affected. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're going to talk about sleep as it relates to the menopause transition. Let's kind of look at. I know that's a really common time for women to struggle with sleep. Let's talk about what are the common challenges, but I also wonder how, how much do you think is um, our sleep habits, like sleep hygiene versus true medical sleep disorders? And do you have a sense? Yeah. I mean, I, I would have to just go based on my own clinical experience and yeah. I would say probably like 70, 30. So 70% is sort of our sleep hygiene, our lifestyle. I mean, the menopause transition is a really busy time for women, right? They have children who are growing up. Some might be even getting ready to leave the house. You're peaking in your career if you're in the workforce. You have aging parents. Um, you may be having strain in your marriage. So there are so many life factors and stressors that kind of coincide with this time of life that I do think a lot of it has to do with our sleep habits. And then the other 30% is really bona fide sleep disorders, right? Or symptoms related to the menopause transition, such as hot flashes, night sweats, that can actually correlate with you know, impaired sleep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are some of the common sleep complaints around this time? Yeah. So I would say among all comers, it's insomnia. It's some form of insomnia. So that can include difficulty falling asleep. It can include difficulty staying asleep or really just a subjective sensation of not having restorative sleep. And in the menopause transition, I like to think of insomnia in different groups because it really helps with the treatment plan. So I try to tease out from women, are they not sleeping well or having insomnia because of menopausal symptoms, like we talked about, vasomotor symptoms, uh, urinary symptoms, things like that. Because then in that group, I would say, let's first address those menopause symptoms, treating it however is appropriate for that woman, and then reassess. Then there are in people who have insomnia 
as it relates to secondary sleep disorders, right? So that can include obstructive sleep apnea, which is very common at this stage of life, restless leg syndrome. And so that is again, where it would be helpful to do a sleep study to figure that out. And then there's the group of women who we've done a sleep study, there's nothing. Uh, they have no uh, menopausal symptoms to report or those are corrected and treated. And in that group, we call them primary insomnia, meaning there's not, it's not secondary to another sleep disorder. And then I always think about the fourth group where it's more like lifestyle or environmental factors. So if they're a shift worker, if they just don't have enough time for sleep or other lifestyle or behavioral factors that are really interfering with their, with their sleep. So that's how I think about insomnia, which is like I said, one of the most common complaints women have at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see why it's not a quick fix, right? Like you really are having to go through your, you know, from a medical perspective, like your, your differential diagnosis and work through all of those different um, possibilities, which is not just taking a vitamin or a supplement, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how would you approach kind of when, if you're, you've worked through kind of figuring out the most common problems, you've treated the menopausal symptoms, what's your approach to helping a woman develop perhaps better sleep habits? Yeah. So again, it comes down to education, right? So there's a, I mean, I do it every day in my practice, but the real program that I recommend for all women and men alike, if they're suffering from insomnia is really participating in a program that has like a cognitive behavioral therapy piece to it, where it's not only teaching you about the importance of proper sleep hygiene, but it's telling you what to do about your devices, your electronics, what to do when you wake up in the middle of the night, and now you're ruminating on all your to do lists and things and worrying that you're not sleeping and worrying about that you're worrying that you're not sleeping, and how to really work with those thoughts and do relaxation uh, techniques and other behavioral modifications. So really, the CBT program is such an important program for sleep in general, for all comers, teens, adults, men, women, that that's really where I spend a lot of time with patients. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I've had another guest, Dr. Kara Ui, um, probably a year and a half ago now who talked about CBTI and just the value of it. And she's done a workshop for my group as well. Um, it's, it's the human element, isn't it? It's like, that's the part because <laughs> I believe so much in CBT. Like we do a lot of that with our women inside best weight. Um, and there's so much value even to kind of learning how we reframe some of the thoughts that we just believe as facts. And you shared some of those things that we ruminate over at nighttime, but it's that, that human element of like, you have to do the work. <laughs> and that's the tough part. What, what do you see as your uptake, um, amongst your patients? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's like with anything too, like if someone is motivated and really wants to improve and do the work, those are the ones that really have the best response and the long lasting response, right? Like it's fine mm -hmm. that you do the program for six weeks and everything is great. You feel great. You're sleeping well. And then the program ends and it's really your responsibility to continue those habits and, you know, unless someone is very motivated and like we said, is prioritizing sleep, putting it on their to-do list, um, you know, it's hard to, 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 to stop or reverse back to old habits. But if someone is really, really motivated and actually sees when they put the work in, the benefit comes back to them, they're more likely to, to continue that. And I recognize it's hard. Like, as you said in the beginning, like I, I too struggle with bad sleep habits. And as I'm in my bad sleep habits, I know this is bad for me. I should be, <laughs> I tell patients every day and yet I'm doing the same thing. So I recognize that it's hard. And the beauty about sleep sleep is every night is a fresh start, right? Mm. If the night before you, you know, you recognize, you know, I, I did, I was on Instagram too late. I was on my phone. I was watching a Netflix show until really late. It's okay. That night is done. We can't go back and change it. But that night coming is another opportunity to really fix things. And so every night is like a fresh start. Yeah. I love that. Every night's a fresh start. Can you just for people who don't really understand what cognitive behavioral therapy or CBTI is, could you just give like one example perhaps of one of the ruminations that people might have in the middle of the night and how that's reframed and how that's beneficial? Yeah. So again, it's, it's a, it's a cup, it's lots of it, but the most common ones is really putting so much pressure on yourself to sleep well. 
right? Mm. And that you start clock watching and you realize, okay, it's three o'clock and now it's 3.15 and you keep calculating, well, if I don't go to sleep in the next five minutes, I'm only gonna get this number of sleep. And you keep thinking about it and you realize that, wow, if I don't sleep well, my whole day tomorrow is shot. So it's almost like separating yourself from wanting a certain number or getting a certain amount of sleep. And then really just sort of stepping away and saying, you know what, all I can do is the here and now and focus on my breathing, on you know positive thoughts and sort of not perseverating on the fact that as each minute passes, that's one minute less of sleep. Mm -hmm. So it almost sounds like reframing the thoughts that are kind of anxiety inducing that are going to heighten anxiety and make it more difficult to kind of approaching more neutral or more positive thoughts. And the other thing that's important that I I tell patients, and it's not always easy to have this perspective at three o'clock in the morning that you're, you're supposed to be doing this. So I tell patients, you know what, if it's been 15 minutes and in your best guess, cause I also don't want people clock watching, get out of bed. Like it's only going to make things worse, right? So you get out of bed, you go to a different room. If that's available to you, a dimly lit room, you can read a book. I always say, pick a boring book. Don't pick something good and exciting. Cause you won't go back to sleep. And you just sort of separate yourself from the room. And that way you, again, create less anxiety and tension around this need to fall back asleep. And then if 15 minutes, 20 minutes pass by, you start to feel drowsy, go back to bed and you keep repeating that process until eventually you fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Do you ever recommend the sleep like meditations, like the podcasts that you can listen to that kind of- Love it. Yeah, Yeah, I love that stuff. So, you know, I try not to get patients to incur too much cost as they do this, but if they're Mm -hmm. willing to pay for these sleep apps that are out there, they're amazing. Um, They do great sleep meditations, podcasts that just have, you know, reframing of your thoughts and just helping you relax, which I think is huge, right? We need to sort of detach ourselves from the stress of the day and your number one priority as you're falling asleep is sleep. That's it. That's you can't fix anything. You can't worry about work or your kids or your family. You got to focus on yourself and your sleep. So some of those um, apps and meditation sort of soundtracks are excellent. Mm -hmm. And Wagani, do you have an idea of like, what is it that causes women to wake up? I mean, I hear so commonly with the, you know, menopause transition that it's kind of between that two to five o'clock early morning awakening. Is that anxiety that's waking them up like what is that I think it's a little bit of I think it's a little bit of everything I think it has again to do with our sleep hygiene oftentimes isn't optimal we also may be ingesting a lot of stimulants right later in the day that can affect us waking up at that time so if someone is having caffeine or alcohol in the evening you you know you're going to wake up right at that you know six hours later after you've had your last cup of coffee an alcoholic beverage and so that's pretty much a very very typical time that people will wake up I don't I haven't seen any sort of explanation physiologically like what is it about that that three o'clock window that everyone's waking up I think it's a confluence of factors including the hygiene including the use of stimulants um, and you know electronics before bed mm-hmm mm-hmm Let's talk about alcohol for a second, because I, I definitely still hear people saying that they need to have a drink or, or, or choose to maybe choose to have a drink because it helps them wind down and it makes them sleepy at night. And yet I've heard, you know, many studies suggesting that it actually is not going to offer good quality sleep. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So as you know, like alcohol in the the first, you know, minutes, hours that you drink it, it's a, it's a relax, it's a relaxant, right? It relaxes you. It kind of reduces the activity of the frontal lobe. So you feel like relaxed. And I, I agree. I hear that all the time that it helps me relax, helps me fall asleep. And I don't disagree with that, but where we're sort of missing the forest for the trees is that that comes at a cost. And the cost is your sleep is interrupted and you may not even be aware that you're having these wake ups at night because they're often so brief that you don't come to full alertness during the night, but your sleep is very, very fragmented as a result of the metabolism of alcohol at night. And it reduces the amount of REM sleep that you get. We know alcohol hands down is a REM suppressor, right? So you put those two together 
Yes, you'll fall asleep faster, but the quality and quantity of your sleep is affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I always, and, and, you know, I, I I'll, oftentimes I'm a very unpopular physician when I talk <laughs> Men, and I say, okay, well, let's look at your diet. Let's look at your lifestyle. And what are modifications that we can do? As I say to them, it's low hanging fruit. Like we know if we address this, you're going to have some improvement in your sleep. And so I say, you know what, reframe your alcohol content. And maybe it's something you save on the weekends where you don't have to wake up the next day and be productive at work. And, you know, perhaps Sunday through Thursday, it's something you abstain from. And you really focus on your sleep during the week. And then on the weekend, you can revisit. So I try to almost do a, like some negotiating with patients because I just even want them to have the awareness that alcohol can affect your sleep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So alcohol is one big one. One of the lifestyle factors, you mentioned some other in terms of nutrition, even that women can work on. Could you give us some examples of what that can look like? Yeah, I think it's like with all, any recommendation in, in medicine and healthcare, it's, you know, important eating a healthy, balanced diet. Um, we know the flip side is when you sleep poorly, your food choices are affected, right? As I'm sure you've talked on with your patients and listeners, like the hormones that are responsible for making us hungry and making us feel full are sort of imbalanced when we sleep poorly. So the, the, the ghrelin hormone is really activated when you sleep poorly and you're searching for food. And studies have shown that patients actually consume up to 300 calories more when they are chronically sleep deprived. And if you imagine you're doing that every night for weeks and weeks out of the year, well, that's increased calories, that's increased weight, and then all the health consequences that come from that. Um, so again, there's so many reasons why you want to prioritize sleep and also what we choose to eat when we're sleep deprived is affected. So we tend to go for salty foods, carbohydrate rich foods, sweets. And I remember, you know, you probably had this experience too, like in residency, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning, you've been up for 20 plus hours, 24 hours, and you're craving the chips, you're craving the French fries, you want something salty, because that is what your body is telling you it needs when you're sleep deprived. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's such a challenge, I think, for shift workers, which we experienced in residency. And I know it's so difficult for nurses that I speak to. And I'm, I'm so glad to not be doing that anymore. But yeah, a huge <laughs> it's, challenge. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. So what are some like, how can we set ourselves up to if we're really wanting to work on this? Could you give us some, some guidelines? Like I know I this is something even as I'm running more and really focusing on my training, one of the things I need to prioritize is, is sleep. So could you give us some guidelines for that? I think the number one thing is make a commitment to yourself, right? To say, like you were saying, this is a important part of your health. I am committed to doing the work so I can reap the benefits of proper sleep. And when we did that, when our kids were small, right, putting them on a very regimented sleep routine, ensuring their room was dark and had all of the important components of healthy sleep. And that actually doesn't change as we get older, right? So we kind of need to borrow a bit of that um, philosophy in our own life as we as we age. So again, make a commitment to prioritize, prioritize your sleep. Let your family members know that prioritizing sleep is important, right? If you have a partner and you're sharing a room with a partner, it's important that you're both on the same page, right? Because you could be doing all the work, going to bed at the same time, um, you know, uh, eliminating electronics, doing all the meditation. And then if your partner is on, they're on the TV or is staying up and there's a light source. So again, you know, that can affect your sleep. So telling your family members, your partners that, let's do this together, or this is a priority for me. How can you support me in this? Um, and then again, it's, you know, try tracking your sleep and whether that be with apps or watches or even pen and paper, write down, you know what, today I'm going to bed at this time. I'm going to wake up at this time. And how do I feel the next day? Make a scale one to 10, 10 being refreshed, ready to go. You know, one being, I feel poorly and see if there are patterns that emerge. If you went to bed later than usual, if you went out, had a late dinner, if you had alcohol, if you had caffeine late, and kind of see the trends and then you'll know what, what you need to avoid. Mm, that's great. So make the commitment, share that with your friends and family, which is sort of an accountability thing as well. And then track your data, right? Yeah. Is kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah. Do you, just on a 
kind of tangent a little bit, but do you recommend those like sleep trackers? I know there's various different devices, rings, watches, how accurate. And do you think that that's helpful? Yeah. So I, I, I have a love hate relationship with them and I love them because finally people want to improve their sleep. Right. Mm. And they have objective data where they are really committed to getting those numbers, getting that happy face, smiley face, like the good data. And I think that's amazing, right? That's what I want patients to do. But then sometimes some of the activity or the sleep trackers can maybe not do a great a job of correlating to sleep stages. So, you know, what they do is it's sort of like a gen one version of a sleep study. It's called an actigraphy. So it's a movement tracker, right? So it tends to correlate. Well, when you're in deep sleep, you have less movement. So then it says, it thinks that you're in REM sleep or it thinks that you're in deep sleep. Whereas if there's more movement at night, it correlates with lighter stages of sleep. But, you know, unless you're having a in-lab sleep study where you have the full brainwave pattern monitoring, I feel that it tends to sometimes misrepresent your sleep stages. And so some patients will say, you know what, all this week I've been, I've been feeling like I've been having great sleep. I've been doing all the right things and I feel great, but my watch is telling me that I only spent 10% of the night in deep sleep. How is that possible? So I try to give people a little bit of that critical view on some of the data points, but overall, I think if it motivates patients to really look at improving their sleep, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. So it may not be perfectly accurate, but if it's achieving the goal of creating this as a priority, giving you data that you can kind of somewhat track and motivating, then, then it can be helpful. Exactly. Yeah. That's so great. Thanks, Wagani. So as just as before we close, is there anything that we didn't kind of touch on that you think is really important for our listeners? Um, I think just one other thing, when we were talking about some of the sleep disorders that come up at this time of life for women, especially in the menopause transition, I just want to put people in the front of their mind, the uh, prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea mm -hmm. actually is quite high in this, in, in, as we transition in the menopause. Um, normally when we think of sleep apnea, we think of the prototypical male overweight, large neck size loud snoring, gasping at night, et cetera. And yes, that is a very common phenotype of sleep apnea, but for women, we tend to present very differently. You may have a normal weight. You may have some snoring, but it may not be, you know, like that loud snoring that we're, we're, we commonly associate with sleep apnea. And there are a lot of subtle signs like, you know, mood dysregulation, concentration impairment, headaches, irritability. So a lot of these patients don't actually actually come to the sleep clinic right away when they're saying that I'm not sleeping well and I'm having these symptoms because we don't often think that women in fact can present differently than men. So just to let patients know to even bring it up with their primary health care provider, if they feel that they're not sleeping well, it's important to ask, you know what, I'm concerned enough that I would like a sleep assessment um, and, and to push for that. Yeah, that is interesting because I definitely would mainly think of that uh, male phenotype, yeah. you know, in terms of who to screen and who I would be sending for a sleep study. So that's actually really helpful. Is, is there anything specific physiologically about menopause that increases the risk of sleep apnea yeah. at this time? So a, a lot of it has to do with the role of estrogen and upper airway muscle tone. So mm -hmm. what sleep apnea is, it's a sleep disorder where we are stopping breathing at night more than is normal. And when we are younger and have, you know, our reproductive hormones in the normal range, it's less of an issue. But as we age and those hormones go down, our upper airway is more collapsible, which increases the prevalence of sleep apnea in women at the menopause transition, even if their weight hasn't changed from, you know, five years, 10 years previously. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, it's that estrogen deficient state that leads to potentially yeah, a change in the airway tone, tone. Which, yeah. which can lead to more sleep apnea events. Interesting. All right. This has been so, so helpful. I think that um, you've given some really practical directions that people can take if they are wanting to improve their sleep. Um, and I know you do a lot of education and you are uh, you teamed up with one of my previous guests, Dr. Amy Lewis-Bayless, but can you just tell us where we can find you? 
Yeah. So you can find us on Instagram at It's Our Time Canada. And it is our education platform where we are sort of sounding the alarm, if you will, on allowing women to have all of the information that they need to help them through this transition. Um, so please follow us, message us on there if there are topics you want us to cover. Um, but you can definitely see the work that we're doing there. I love it. Thanks so much. It's our time, Canada, and we will also link that in the show notes. Show notes. Thank you so much, Wagani. It's been really great having you. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Sasha.